Hello, everybody. This is Mike. Hope you're doing well as you're listening to this. This is part one of a two-part conversation that I had with my buddy Kevin McClear about the Ballad of Yarmouth Castle. I was originally intending this to be a one-parter, but when Kevin and I finished up, we realized we had had so much fun that the recording went on for an hour. And I know that you guys love the show, but I didn't want to subject you to a full hour of that in one sitting, so I decided to cut this down into two parts. So the first part will be coming out on or about December 19th. The second part will be coming out around the first of the new year. So sit back and enjoy. Hope you like it. The first guest of the evening is truly a poet. He's an artist. He is a friend and an inspiration to anyone who I think who has ever played the guitar uh, or tried to write poetry. Would you please welcome Gordon Lightfoot. <laughs> It's four o'clock in the afternoon and the anchors have been weighed. From Miami to Nassau, she's bound across the waves. She'll be heading south through Biscayne Bay into the open sea, Yarmouth Castle. She's a dying and don't know it. This is Carefree Highway Revisited, the show that celebrates Gordon Lightfoot's music song by song, a proud member of the That's Not Canon podcast network. I'm your host, Mike Messner, and with me today is a fellow Lightfoot fan making his second appearance on the show from the great state of Alaska, Kevin McClear. Kevin, welcome back to Carefree Highway Revisited. Thanks for having me. It's, oh, pleasure is all mine. Now, why did you want to talk about Yarmouth Castle? And this is a song that is fairly obscure. Um, it only appeared on one album. Uh, and I've heard scuttlebutt that it was not necessarily one of Gordon's favorites when he looked back on it. Why, what's the meaning of this song to you? Yeah. To understand why I love this song, and I do love this song, but to understand why I love it, you have to understand three other things. Uh, first off, Yarmouth Castle, uh, she was a ship that um, had sailed very profitably for quite a while under the name Evangeline. Um, she had seen a couple of owners, and she was a ship, she was a, a steel ship with a wooden superstructure, and literally could not be certified by the U.S. Coast Guard for, for, uh, for the passage of, uh, of, you know, for, for passenger vessels. And so the owners, well, one of them went bankrupt and sold to another, what we now call a shell company, a reflag from Panama. And the Coast Guard was legally unable to enforce the rules that would have otherwise, um, you know, prevented her sailing. And so she was able to, through this loophole, um, transport U.S. citizens, uh, you know, passengers uh, from uh, Florida to to the Bahamas. Um, and it's worth remembering, it's worth knowing that in the course of history, uh, the second most the second most dangerous thing to a sailor, aside from the the weather itself, was the um the owners the 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 uh inability or indecision or in uh, the reasoning for owners to not actually maintain their vessels um and we don't get that story very often we don't no and we'll talk a little bit about the backstory and all of this but the thing that i think of is that the yarmouth castle had actually passed some sort of a safety test three weeks before it mm -hmm. sailed um, but it does make you wonder how thorough that safety check was, given everything that we're going to see in the events of November 1965 to this vessel, which is its last voyage. It was as thorough as the U.S. Coast Guard could do for a foreign flag vessel. And that's the point. Something to remember also is that um, this story uh, led to a uh, changing of international treaties because the U.S. Coast Guard was, was unable to do more. Um, and so you asked me why I, I, I like this song and I, I, I like this song because, um, unlike other songs that Gordon does, and he, he does a lot of fantastic songs about, about sailing, about the oceans and whatnot. Um, there's, 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 you know, the record of the Ebony Fitzgerald, uh, has, uh, a, a storm come in, um, you know, the, the ghosts of Cape Horn, it's still all about the, the, the environment, but not 
the political environment, not the economic environment. And that is an important, uh, an important part. That, I mean, like um, a couple of years back, a lot was made about uh, Andrea Gale and the perfect storm. And in that, uh, it was, there was a discussion about the modifications that were made by the owners uh, that made her an unseaworthy vessel. But that came out in a discussion about meteorology, not about the economics of what's going on. And, and here we have a case where we have a vessel that was um, only sailing through a loophole. Um, and she did pass the inspection. She passed every inspection the Coast Guard could legally throw at her. And this is where we go. Well, you, you mentioned the fact that uh, there is a, there's not a discussion in Edvin Fitzgerald or Cape Horn or Christian Island or any other thing. There's no discussion of the man-made circumstances mm -hmm. that are there. And I think another thing that differentiates this is that unlike the other two that we've mentioned, there are survivors in this mm -hmm. one. And the song references those people who can look back and say, this was what our experience was. Whereas the other two, everybody went to the bottom of the sea or was never accounted for after, after that. Um, and so th this is, to me, the thing that makes it all the more interesting mm -hmm. because it really showed that Lightfoot really had to get his story right uh, in writing this. Now, that's the content of it aspect for me. I mean, the thing that I like about it as a song is that it's a straight folk song. It's very typical of early Lightfoot uh, in that it's not overly personal. But it also has a beginning, middle, and end, which mm -hmm. is also something that he's not necessarily known for telling stories. Of course, he does them from time to time, but this is a straight-up story song, and it could probably find itself in the category that another podcast might do about this. What to you is the best setting to listen to this? Is there a particular place, a particular time of day, a particular thing that you'd be doing where you'd think I'd really like to hear this song? Hopefully not sailing on a ship from uh, between Nassau and Miami. Perhaps not there. Um, but there is a place for it. Say, if you're in a harbor and you miss the tide because of a storm and you don't know if you're going to miss the other tide, it's a ghost story, you know? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that, that happens fast in those moments when uh, time is not important because you're waiting on the tide and you, there's nothing, nothing else and you can reflect on it. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps when you're getting ready to go talk to a legislature about laws that need to be changed. Yeah, and we'll talk a little bit about the safety of lives at sea, which was the series of laws that was passed probably as a result of this particular incident. Um, let's talk a little bit about how it got written. Now, the story that I heard from Jennings' biography and other places was that Lightfoot was actually staying with uh, Joni Anderson, who would later be better known as Joni Mitchell, and her then husband Chuck. They were living in Detroit, and he read in a magazine about this had happened, uh, about this incident, uh, that there had been, been this old steamer, it had gone uh, out to sea, it had caught fire, it had sunk about two-thirds of the way between Miami and Nassau. Um, and, of course, it's not the only time that he's going to be inspired by a maritime disaster to sit down and write a song about it. Um, is there anything you can add to that, or if, is that pretty much the story that you've heard about how it got written? Well, uh, I don't have anything uh, that I can add. I can't speak to his mind or intentions, but I will uh, point out that um, as Evangeline, um, Yarmouth Castle uh, sailed between uh, Boston, Yarmouth, and Boston, and, and St. John's. Uh, and so um, in her early years, uh, before, uh, before she was a World War II troop transport, she was an American Canadian vessel. Um, and so um, it's entirely possible that, uh, that Lightfoot knew of her, um, you know, through other connections um, and, and has, had seen photos of her and, and, and other things. The other thing is, I don't think it's um, beyond reason to suspect that the person who wrote Don Quixote would uh, see that there's also very much a sense of class in the story. 
and the fact that uh, she was an old vessel, she was not a vessel that would be transporting uh, the rich and famous. Um, and it's entirely possible that that led into uh, some of the decisions that were made that led her to be where she was. Well, it, I think the economic part of it certainly is true because they this is a ship that is marginal at best okay it passed you know some sort of safety ex safety inspection but as you said that may not have been thorough and there was only so much that the u.s coast guard could do given the fact that it was a panamanian uh freighter or a panamanian ship um and the fact is that there was just probably too much money to be made for the people that were organizing this cruise to pass it up and so that doesn't certainly make the voyage right, but it does make it a little bit more understandable. Um, Lightfoot did say something about this at the time. He said, and I'm quoting directly, shipwrecks are different than your coal mine or railroad disasters. They have a different quality, a mystic and mysteriousness, maybe mystique and myriad, mis, mystique and mysteriousness. Witnesses don't usually live to tell the tale. Um, and I think that probably says a lot about his obsession, if you can call it that, with the human disasters that go along with industry. Is that a sentiment that you would agree with? I think so. Okay. So let's start looking at the lyrics here. Well, it's four o'clock in the afternoon and the anchors have been weighed from Miami to Nassau. She's bound across the waves. She'll be heading south through Biscayne Bay into the open sea. Yarmouth Castle, she's a dying and don't know it. Now, the first three lines, okay, that's simple stage setting. It would be like any other narrative, uh, any other story. But then Yarmouth Castle, she's a dying and don't know it. That's a foreboding line. Um, that could be uh, a good beginning of a radio show or a very a beginning of a good TV movie. You saw something that resonated with another one of of uh, Lightfoot's lyrics here, didn't you? Absolutely. I think in many ways that this, this we're going to look through this and see that this is somewhat of a rough draft for Ed Rutland and for Fitzgerald. And in, the, in both songs, you start with a kind of prosaic um, uh, first couplet, and then you, you end up with a, a much more um, jarring line, you know. The lake, it is said, never gives up her dead is 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 something that goes with the prosaic uh, science so, so it's, it it starts off by saying that, you know this is a song of the ocean and all the romance and oh by the way <laughs> um and and i think that um as a storytelling uh piece i mean it's it's very much a a throw forward uh, to this uh, songs you would later write We'll be right back to our conversation with Kevin McClear about the Ballad of Yarmouth Castle. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Is that song really a cover? What instrument are they playing there? What do those crazy lyrics mean? If you're the kind of person who thinks about stuff like that, you're in luck because I've got just the podcast for you. How Good It Is chooses a single song each episode and takes a dive into the story behind the song and the artist who made it famous. I'm Claude Call. You can find me in your favorite podcast software or just point your browser to howgooditis.com. How good it is. Hello, I'm JT, a lifelong student of the paranormal and the unexplained. I've spent over 35 years researching and learning about a wide range of subjects, from UFOs and cryptids to ghosts and the supernatural. From hidden and lost treasures to mankind's mysterious past and all other things mysterious and Fortean. Each week I'll bring you some relevant and interesting articles in this genre as well as a different topic. Some you may be familiar with, but many you most likely will never have known existed. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. And let me be your tour guide as we explore the unexplained on the paranormal sun. And I think it's also ironic and interesting to note that both of these are set in November. And I mm -hmm. think, if I'm not mistaken, that they are very close in terms of the part of November to each other. I mean, the Yarmouth Castle disaster 
and the Edmund Fitzgerald disaster, they happened within a few days of each other within the month of November. Is that right? I think so. I think yeah, so. I think it was in maybe two, three days. So I thought I mean, that's coincidence, but I think it is kind of funny to think about. Now, let me ask you this. When you, if you were on this ship uh, and you saw the state it was in, uh, you hear this, as it says, groan of protest as the lines are being cast away. That implies that the engine is old. Maybe it implies that the sides of the ships are scraping against something. Uh, if you were a passenger, wouldn't that make you want to get off this ship as soon as you could? Not necessarily. See, part of, and later on, what we'll, 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 talked about the, this beautiful line where it talks about where, where there's the, this paint that makes her young. Um, part of the sail, uh, and I'm, I'm talking about sails and uh, bill of sail, not, not sailing as I'm sailing away. Right. Part of the sail of this is, is uh, it's a working man's ability to get to the Bahamas. And so by the time the passengers are on board, they're not looking for trouble, you know? Um, and that's, that's, Part of how you can get away with, I mean, um, like I said, so much of maritime history is, is full of mariners making do with uh, ships that are not maintained uh, because, um, you know, owners are, are, are away and negligent and, and not relevant. I mean, there's uh, insurance for, uh, for dealing with uh, what, what might happen um, versus a very real cost to to dealing with these things so i think the sailors they know the ship on borrowed time but maybe not this one so in a sense though they are rolling the dice with Absolutely. this ship and with the lives of the people on board but there is a necessity there as you said you know that they've got to get to the bahamas and there's the uh, mythology i mean the idea of sailing, the idea, I mean, going back to the Greeks and the idea of, 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 you know, uh, the tales of, if you go look at Odysseus and, you know, all of the part of Odysseus that happens on, uh, when he's actually on a boat is terrifying, uh, but do you roll the dice and you go forward? Um, and there's this, um, feeling that, um, you know, it's all in God's hands anyway, uh, because the sea is, is, is the master of us all. Um, so why not this time? Yeah. That was probably the only justification they could say, okay, well, you know, it sounds a little fatalistic if you think about it. But on the other hand, uh, they do see the conditions and mm -hmm. maybe they're deliberately looking the other way because they think, look, there's a job to be done. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, we need to do this. I can tell you that as someone who's not overly familiar with the sea, um, if I had a choice, I would hear this and see this. OK, the grumble of her engines, the rust along her spine. Clearly, I can't see the bottom of the boat, but um, I, I would think to myself, gosh, am I really do I really feel OK? And then. I would probably reassure myself with, well, if it was really un not seaworthy, it wouldn't be here. So away we go. And if I was the purser, I'd put a martini in your hand and say, welcome to the Bahamas. <laughs> well, once I got there, certainly you would. <laughs> uh, but the sands run out within her heart. Now, is that a metaphor oh, for the, um, the sands through an hourglass or is yeah. there some other meaning here? Yes. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? I love because it. Yeah. There's, there's only, I mean, you have, uh, you have a boat and it, it is fatalistic. I mean, if you, if you listen to sailors talk, they don't say that they're going, you know, a to someplace. They say they're going towards someplace because there's always that point when the sands are going to run out and you don't know and you don't want to, uh, you don't want to tempt it. Right. So. The sands run out within her heart because she's this living beast. Everything in this song is alive. Uh, there's, there's a boat that's, that's living and it's about to die. There's a fire that's living and it's about to live. There's a captain who's living and it's about to run. Uh, there, there, are, there, there are passengers whose living is hoping to live. Um, every element of this, of, this, um, of this song 
is alive. And in this case, you have the heart of the, uh, of the liner and, and she's giving it all she's got, but the time's just running out on her. And to, you know, use another spin on the word living. Okay. This is how these men who are on the ship are making their living. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's economic semantics there. <laughs> you want to look at it that way. Uh, a, a tiny spark glows red. It smolders through the evening. There's laughter overhead. Now, we don't know exactly how the fire started. Uh, it may have been bad wiring. It may have been sparks entering through the ventilation system. We do know that the fire started in a room on the main deck and that there it was that room was being used as a storage room and it all all sorts of stuff in that room that was flammable i mean we know more about that, though because we know that the room was originally when she was uh sailed in northern northern waters that room is a a, a good a good room to have because it's right above the boiler it was so hot but going to the bahamas it wasn't and so we know that they turned a stateroom into a storeroom in the process, they stripped all of the paneling off the walls because the paneling was more expensive elsewhere. And so we know that it was a room where the insulation was literally right there. There was nothing. There was nothing between the fire and the insulation. So this goes back to the the the, the complete madness of of letting the ship sail because that room, that storeroom, but. Uh, uh, the, the the protections that were originally even built into the uh, the building uh, the ship uh, as minimal as they were uh, it, you know, the storeroom didn't have sprinklers right and it didn't have anything between it and all the insulation on the inside of the of, of the structure yeah and it really does bring back I mean obviously it's a different uh, set of circumstances but I really think that the idea that good ship and true was a boat mm. we chewed this isn't any difference it's just in a different uh, set of weather conditions yeah, and yeah, a different yeah. part of the globe but it's the same setup and that brings us into the next part of this where you have people completely oblivious to what's going on the men are served there's my martini saying welcome to the Bahamas <laughs> uh, and the cards are dealt and the pa drinks are passed around deep within the fire starts burn the f deep within the fire starts a burning. No one has any idea at this particular point in the story what is going on. They're just eating and laughing and talking and carrying on. And the ship's already lost. And the ship is already lost, but no one, not even the crew at that particular point in time, knows why. Um, and the reason for that is that although there was a watch done by the night watchman, it wasn't a very thorough search and it probably completely neglected this particular room where the fire started. Now, I don't know that they could have completely stopped it in any case, but we know that there were minutes lost where the night watchman might have caught that thing and alerted somebody or put it out himself or something like that. And that didn't happen. And that adds a note of tragedy mm -hmm. to the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, now it's midnight on the open sea and the moon is shining bright. Some people join the party and others say good night. There's many who are sleeping now. It's been a busy day and a tiny wisp of smoke is rising. Oh Lord, she grows. I'm burning. And so we know that between midnight and one in the morning, when many, not all, but many of the passengers were probably asleep, um, we know that they are noticed the crew are noticing there's smoke and there's heat and some of them are searching for a fire but that particular last phrase oh lord she groans i'm burning it's wonderful personification of the ship as a person now we've seen this in other ships that he or has talked about mm -hmm. in other uh songs but this may be the only time when we hear about the ship actually verbalizing something or saying some word or making some word some noise that he turns into a word and am i right in thinking that i can't think of any other time when he does that yeah it's beautifully done um but it does bring up another thing i don't know if you heard the episode that i did on ghosts of cape horn uh, mm -hmm. But my my guest, Dave Stewart, there talked about the way that people identify with ships and that they have a certain identity or personality that is more than the sum of its parts. 
um, that you can't quite put it into some in, in into words the visceral feeling of a ship and i think lightfoot is actually coming as close as he could at this point in his career to actually putting that feeling into words and you having you know surveyed his music pretty much from beginning to end do you agree with that i do i will say that um past life i um i actually broke up a couple of ships i was part of breakup crew um and we, we took apart these these vessels that are they're much finer worksmanship than anything I'll ever build. And the first thing we do, um, you know, we have the vessel up on land. We have everything ready. The first thing we do is we have a ceremony where we take away her name. We take the nameplate off. And from that point forward, um, the vessel is, is, is no longer a living thing. And it is absolutely necessary, um, especially for people who had spent time with that vessel. And so you're absolutely correct about that personification. Um, and in this case, um, it ties back to the sands running out in her heart. Um, and, and this is a much more active living vessel than in, in his other music. We'll be right back to our conversation with Kevin McClear about the Ballad of Yarmouth Castle. But first, a word from a podcast partner or two. Do you like classic albums? Technically, like the, you know, the 20th century albums, um, such as like Beatles, Led Zeppelin, <laughs> Rolling Stones. I've only had Beatle episodes so far, however, we'll be doing more. But welcome to my show, or rather, hey, welcome to check out my show. <laughs> um, all those years ago, a classic album podcast with the dipping sauce. Um, as you can see, the George Harrison reference. Um, I review classic albums, um, not of those the likes of Beethoven, the likes of the Beatles and Rolling Stones, and like I mentioned earlier, uh, or what have you. <laughs> um, so yeah, check it out. It's every Monday. Um, I do albums, conspiracies, songs, all that jazz. So just check it out. All those years ago, a classic album podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> Let someone understand, but her silent plea is wasted in the playing of the band. Now, I couldn't find any information about the idea that a band was playing, although it's likely that it was. There was some music being played uh, because, you know, people are partying on this. It's an overnight cruise, so why not? Um, We do know that the crew didn't announce over the PA system at this particular point in the timeline that anything was wrong. Um, and that the captain didn't activate the general alarm. Mm -hmm. Now, the question that I have that I wasn't clear on in my research was that, was that because he was sort of poo-pooing the problem or is it because he just literally couldn't get to the switch or the toggle or whatever that would have activated that? Do you have an angle on why what needed to happen there didn't happen? Um, Looking at the official reports, what happened, uh, the, the captain got a report of a fire. Um, a, a crewman um, found a passenger who was uh, stumbling up a, um, up a stairwell after being badly burned and got that report to the captain. The captain himself left the bridge uh, to go do a, or do a report or to, to see for himself what was going on with the ship. 
instead of sending one anyone else. So uh, there was no one specifically on the bridge um, with the authority of captain to to uh, order and abandon. And um, the captain did not put out a message before he went to go see what was going on. And by the time he got back to the bridge, there was too much damage to the system to be able to even use the whistles. Um, and this is another thing that that's changed you now uh, with uh, survival alt life at sea. My parents were actually on a cruise ship at a fire. Um, and throughout the entire process, um, every five minutes, there was an announcement that started off by saying that there's a, there's, been, uh, there's a small fire in the incinerator room. It's being contained. And every five minutes, there was a further announcement. And that's, that's something that wasn't, I mean, at, at the time, uh, good practice actually was to not panic people. Because, you know, if you, if you look at the, the, the stories that we have of Titanic, you know, where there's a fairly orderly evacuation versus Lusitania, where there was a very, I mean, there's no time. And it was a very chaotic evacuation. And, and a lot of the people who were lost in Lusitania didn't need to be lost, but when people panic. And so, so there is a legitimate reason to, um, to not necessarily give uh, the, the notice of a fire on an old wooden ship too soon. Um, but they missed their opportunity. And by the time they, they, they were ready to, uh, to do so, they were unable to. And it's another tragic note, you know, in all of this, that, you know, the circumstances determine that everybody's dancing on her deck. They're having such a time. Then a voice says, shut up and deal. I'm losing. And this is just cinematic. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's reinforcing the idea that people are carrying on. They're doing what people get up to when they're on cruises in the 1960s and maybe today too. Um, You know, that they have no idea what's going on. Mm -hmm. Deep within the Yarmouth Castle, the fire begins to glow. It leaps into the hallways and climbs and twists and grows. And the paint she wore to keep her young, oh, Lord, how well it burns. And soon that old fire is arranged. And the, I, I love the way that he's so compact with these lines. Okay, yes, mm-hmm. this is an old ship, but we've given it a new coat of paint, so maybe it will allay somebody's fears. But maybe the paint was actually acting as an accelerant because it may have been an oil-based paint um, so that it was yet another aspect in why this thing should never have gone to sea in the first place. Absolutely. And and the other thing about this is from the artistry is at this point now we have another living being because he's personified the fire. He's let the fire have its own um, agency in this. But the paint. Oh, the paint. One of the reasons why Yarmouth Castle wasn't able to launch her, her lifeboats was because of that paint. They, they painted over uh, the, the ropes so much that the ropes couldn't go through the, block, uh, the blocking falls. Oh. And so there were lifeboats that couldn't be launched. Uh, some of the reason people couldn't get out of their cabins was because the windows were painted shut because right. it was a, a, a sloppy job of paint. Because this goes back to the negligence and, and, the, and the fact that the company, I mean, um, the company that was running Yarmouth Castle at the time bought her off for bankruptcy sale. And so we, 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 we have this, this uh, work they've been doing with, with a company that had not the resource to do it. And so, yes, the paint, um, which, which kept her looking young, uh, was very much a part of this tragedy. Uh, and, and the fire, I, I don't know how much the paint, I don't know how much the fire needed the paint, but this certainly gives... Uh, that very living element. Yeah, and it's it's a, almost a, a Greek tragedy kind of tone, isn't it? Uh, you it, know, is, because it is. We think about Prometheus and we think about the mythology surrounding the gods and fire and those kinds of things. Um, and I don't know if Lightfoot had that particular piece of lore in mind, but it certainly had, it smacks of that, doesn't it? Um, Up beneath the bridge, it's climbing fast. The captain stands aloft. He calls up to the boatswain and says, boatswain, we are lost. So the fire is spreading so quickly in a five-minute period for reasons that we've discussed and that we will continue to discuss. Um, The crew had to leave the bridge completely. Uh, the, The captain had already left for reasons you've already said. Well, now everybody's off the bridge. 
So even if they had had the authority to sound the alarm, they really could not have done so because they were just not physically in a place to do that. Um, there was an abandoned ship command given, but the passengers didn't hear it because either they didn't use the shipwide PA system or they couldn't get to. You there? I, I am here. I'm having some technical problems the last couple of minutes. So. Okay. Well, I'm going to back up just a minute then. Um, so the crew has left the bridge completely. There's no one there who has, whether they have the authority or not to, uh, activate the abandoned ship command in such a way that everybody can hear it. There was a command that was given, but the passengers didn't hear it either because they couldn't activate the PA system or the PA system wasn't working at this point, or by the time they gave that command, nobody could have gotten to it. I mean, whether they had the authority or not. Okay. Um, up beneath the bridge, it's climbing fast. The captain stands aloft. He calls up to the boatswain and says, boatswain, we are lost. So now everybody's off the bridge. Uh, so it's no longer just a case of you have no authority to sound a a, a command like abandon ship. There is literally no one there to do it in a position where they can actually physically reach out and activate that system. Maybe the system wasn't working at all at that point, but it's another tragic element to all of this that, you know, by the time that they know that the place has to be abandoned or that the ship has to be abandoned, it's too late. No one can give that command. For the ragged hoses in the racks, no pressure do they hold, and the people down below will still be dying. Now, Kevin, this brings up a question for me, because I had heard that the reason the hoses weren't working is because there were too many valves open to the water supply for any pressure to be going through the hoses. So you really have sort of a trickle rather than, you know, a straight stream of water coming out at a high pressure. But what I'm wondering is, is it reasonable to assume that the hoses were also dilapidated? That would be consistent with the other disrepair that we've seen. Yeah, more than reasonable. That was actually cited in the after action reports. Um, so we know uh, as a legal fact that some of the hoses were split. Okay. So yet another aspect of all of this. Mm -hmm. All amidships, oh, she's blazing now. It's spreading fore and aft. The people are a scrambling as the fire blocks their path. Now, you said that some of them had tried to get out through the cabin windows, but they were either painted closed or they were rusted closed or they hadn't been opened. And so there was elemental damage so that they couldn't be opened. And many of the passengers probably had no way out at all. It's another aspect of bad maintenance that you alluded to, not just with the paint, but with, again, the mm -hmm. fact that the owners had bought this thing on the cheap. They did not have the ability to maintain it, and the inspection was certainly not as thorough as it ought to have been. The sex solution. And the captain in his lifeboat is a leaving. Now, this to me is an enormous violation of maritime etiquette, okay, that the captain is leaving the ship ahead of the passengers. And that looks cowardly. And it is, in fact, probably a violation of all sorts of regulations out on the high seas. He later testified, the guy who was the captain who survived, look, I left because there was no way to reach any of the rescue vessels. We'll talk about the two rescue vessels that were involved here. There was no way to use the communication equipment on board, so this is the only way that I could go and get help. So is that consistent with your understanding of it, and do you have any commentary on that action? One of the lifeboats had a radio system on it. That was not the lifeboat the captain was on, but the argument the captain was making was actually that he was trying to reach the other lifeboat and be able to call in and radio for help. And so the reality is, if you go by the numbers and the other ships weren't available, uh, and you just went with the people who were on lifeboats and the people who would have survived, 80% of the survivors would have been uh, crew members. That tells you who was on the lifeboats that actually got off. Whether or not it was cowardly, um, it certainly does look like that's not the way it should have gone. I think that this is one of those areas where, as a artist, the songwriter can't really equivocate because this is one of those points where the story is important and 
in this story, you have a lifeboat that left with a captain and crew members. And uh, regardless of what the captain's actual motive was, this is part of the tragedy as far as who was or was not able to get off uh, off the vessel. Yeah, and not only that, but I mean, that's one more boat mm-hmm. that was not available to the rest of the people who are on board the ship, mm-hmm. um, irrespective, again, of his motivations. We know that there were two ships that were involved in the rescue. The first one is not mentioned in the song, and perhaps it wasn't in the magazine article. But a Finnish freighter was a few miles ahead of the Yarmouth Castle, and the mate saw on the radar screen that the Yarmouth Castle had slowed way down. So he looked out and just got some dead reckoning and saw the ship on fire, woke up the captain, and the captain tried to radio Nassau for help and nobody answered for whatever reason. So then the captain of this Finnish ship got in touch with the U.S. Coast Guard. They're going to come in later in the story. Mm -hmm. Um, The Finnish ship turned around and went back toward the Yarmouth Castle. It picked up the captain's boat. And then it launched its own lifeboats to try to rescue passengers. And some of those, they did actually launch some motorboats also, Mm -hmm. and they ended up towing some of the lifeboats from the Yarmouth Castle to uh, the Finnipulp. And then we get into the Bahama Star. Did I get the whole story there? Yeah, except for one other element of that's worth noting is that the lifeboats that came off the Yarmouth Castle didn't have oarlocks. A lifeboat is a fairly large vessel. You want it big enough to be able to deal with the ocean. Sure. And you don't want to be trying to paddle it like it's a canoe. Uh, you need to have the oar locks so you can have the lever arms, so you can have long enough sweeps or, or oars that you can actually maneuver it. And so without oar locks, which is a very simple, very inexpensive piece of equipment, it's a little metal thing that attaches to the side of the uh, lifeboat that you rest the oar in, so you have a fulcrum. Without oarlocks, they were trying to navigate by basically paddling the, these large, unwieldy vessels like their canoes. Um, and so the Finnish vessel that came that was able to tow them, first off, they had a watchman who was observant to everything around. The vessel was ahead of the Yarmouth Castle. There's no reason for them to necessarily to keep tabs on the radar uh, behind them. But being diligent, they did. They had situational awareness of everything. Two, they hailed the Yarmouth Castle and tried to find, uh, find what was going on. And three, they had the equipment to actually make the Yarmouth Castle's ineffective equipment effective. The oar lock is something, that, as you were explaining that, it's been a little while since I've been in a rowboat, but I can remember that we had those. And of course, a, the typical rowboat is much, much smaller than a lifeboat from a ship this large. So Now it makes sense that they would need that kind of leverage to make a lifeboat go anywhere, because otherwise you might as well just be trying to bail out, you know, a a vessel with a Dixie cup. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just going to be such an impossible task. And thanks for listening, everybody. If you like this well enough to listen to the whole thing, tell somebody about it. Carefree Highway Revisited is on Apple, Spotify, Acast, or wherever you get your listening matter. Our website is www.lightfootpodcast.com. I'd like to make a special request for you to visit my Patreon page. I love this show so much, and I want to keep it going, and you're in a position to help. Please head over to www.patreon.com slash carefreehighwayrevisited. A dollar or two a month is all I ask. You can reach me, Mike Messner, at teachermike72 at gmail.com. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode, but we'll be back in two weeks with the rest of this conversation with Kevin McClear on the Ballad of Yarmouth Castle. Until then, this is Mike Messner reminding you, run for the roses, but don't forget to stop and smell them. We'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.